thank you for that, Colin. That was a pretty fab introduction. So, <laughs> live up to that. Thank you. Well, I will be able to do that because the wonderful, delightful David Harvey gave me something to read out because, of course, I shall not be here tomorrow evening when I think there is the concert, the shindig. So, he's given me some of his own material to share. Bless him. This is a rare occasion, apparently. So, relativity. There was a young lady called Bright who could travel much faster than light. She left home one day in a relative way and got home the previous night. <laughs> Thank you, David. More material coming this way. That would be fabulous. <laughs> so it's lovely being back here at the summer school. I think it's fabulous to see so many new faces. And every time I look up, I see another one. Hi there. <laughs> so how are we all doing? Has it been a great summer school so far? Yes. Cool. So it's all relative to what your experience was going to be as well as to what you had in your head. So who knows about Einstein's theory of relativity? E equals mc squared. Any experts? <laughs> Fabulous. Who would like to stand up here then? <laughs> so I want to think about relativity as we experience, or Einstein was talking about it in terms of time and space. But that's on the outside. I want to look at it on the inside how we experience time and space and relationships on the inside in our heads and in our hearts because that is where we do our spiritual journeying is it not i'm going to be asking you some questions as we go through because if you think how am i going to be standing here for the next 45 minutes here to entertain you it's not going to kind of work out like that <laughs> it never does who knows what words are going to come through next so how do we feel that we are on our spiritual journey? Have we got there yet? I had somebody asking me earlier, so when do we arrive? I do all this work and then what? There's more work to do. Does that ever get at all frustrating? It's not just me, is it? No. So why are we doing all of this work? What's the purpose? What's the point? So why are you? We may as well get stuck in as we're down here. I think that is one of the best examples I've heard. We may as well get stuck in as we're down here. Is it because we want to allow ourselves to be more of who we are? Do we perhaps? Life seems too mundane. And it can be very mundane if we just focus on the physical, on what we're expected, what we learned at school. Anybody here a real fan of the Kardashians? I kind of knew that because you're not the kind of mundane people that watch that, right? But it's really easy to get stuck into all these reality shows. That's what a lot of people are doing. It's the reality that they think is what's going on in the world. You're right. You hadn't even heard of it, Gary. That's a good sign. <laughs> so why do you think we've chosen to be here? Not special, not better than, but in a different way, looking to find more about ourselves. What is the drive that makes us want to do that? Knowledge, the soul. The soul. The we know there's more. There's an inner compulsion. Hi, there's an inner compulsion, and it's the soul compulsion that is making us want to seek more, to expand more. Now, it's my belief that in fact we are all perfect as we are. We have that divine spark within us. So actually, in many ways, it's not about learning more stuff and stuffing more in. Maybe it's about dropping all the things that we're not so that that divine spark that we are can expand and shine brighter out of us and we can step into that power and be all of who we are and engage with other people as to all of who they are too and see each other for the truth of who we are rather than the illusions. Because how often is it that we're relating from one illusion to another illusion and making that into our false reality? Anybody else ever done that? All of us. <laughs> For a moment, I thought you were going to say none of us. <laughs> Could have been a special little group of one here. So everything really is relative to everything else, is it not? And everybody is relative to everybody else. We're all like big cells, all connected in with each other. So how we are affects all the people and stuff around us and vice versa. So it's about boundaries to a degree. 
but it's also about the truth of our own purpose, our own sense of where we're going and what we're here to do. We've discussed that we're compulsed by the soul to become more, to embrace the journey of letting go of all the things that we're not. So why aren't we there right now? You guys know a lot of stuff. I know, I've sat in the workshops with you. We even had the privilege of leading one or two. So are we applying everything that we learn? Or do we just sometimes come along, listen to stuff, go, oh, that was nice, and leave it behind? Do we apply it? So we have lifetimes of ingrained personality, personality habits. Emotional patterns, emotions, such wonderful things, are they not? <laughs> yep, conditioning. Anybody else had any conditioning, any childhood? Anybody have anything they grew up with, learning and believing to be true, but actually wasn't? One of us, yeah. And in a way, it's a bit like, have you come across those pebbles that you can put in those polishing machines? And you put all the pebbles in together and they all rub up against each other. And in that rubbing up, everything becomes polished. So we're all the teachers and we're all the students. So we're all relative to each other. So what are we teaching? What do you think about the people now in your family? What are you teaching them, people close to you? Are you teaching them to live at the best, at the highest, at the most exciting and powerful, passionate place that you can be? Or is it all a bit crap? Are we allowed to use words like that? We're allowed to use words like that. I've just done it. <laughs> four, letter, four letter words are not allowed unless they include words like not. Okay, lovely crap. So, <laughs> <laughs> is it good to be conventional? Or is it good to break out of those boxes? break out. So if we can break out, we can break out of the rules, right? Good. There we go. <laughs> that was a big yawn I heard from somewhere. Is this not what you were expecting? <laughs> oh no, she's coming to see me. <laughs> we're all in the same boat together though, are we not? So think about now something that's happening in your life right now that you're not perhaps as happy with as you'd like it to be. Has anybody got something that only we could sort this out? Life would be so much easier. Yeah? So what could we use, what could we do that would make that better? You know stuff, we've agreed that. So what do you do? How do you apply what you know? With intention? We rise above it. Do we rise above it and look down on it like a saint? Or do we rise above it and go, I've learned that one, I'll leave it behind. <laughs> we'll do that one. <laughs> yeah. What else? You try to use positive energy. Positive, um, yeah, positive energy, no positive thoughts about Okay. You try to use positive energy and positive thoughts. Have you ever tried to do something? Does it always work when you try? So how often do you try and how often do you really do something? How often do you really apply what you know? Is knowledge power? Here's a question. Is knowledge power? Yes. Yep. Yes. No! Knowledge applied is power. When you apply it, you do something with it, you make some magic happen. How often, and I did this so much at school, how often do we sit there just taking stuff in but not applying it? Well, I'm going to show you something about that. Why doesn't everybody stand up for a moment? I'd like you to face the chair that you're sitting in. You said I could be unconventional, right? <laughs> but not that. <laughs> what I'd like you to do right now, and listen to this instruction really carefully, I would like you to try and lift up that chair. Ah, I didn't say do it, put it down over there. Da, 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 da. No, did not say do it. Well, what are you all doing? You're just standing there. <laughs> okay, turn around, sit yourselves back in your chair. The reason that didn't work is because your subconscious mind does not understand the word try. 
You know, if you ask somebody to do something for you, can you get that report ready for me? Can you get it to me for Monday? And you hear the words, I'll try. You kind of know you're not going to get that report, don't you? <laughs> Your subconscious mind knows that if you say the word try, you're not very committed, you're not convinced. If you say that you will do something or you will not do something and you become committed with that intention, that's when the magic starts to happen when you have the intention and the commitment. But how often do we hear stuff, and people do it in churches up and down the country, you hear stuff, it's breached to you, and it's something that's kind of out there. It's relative to us, but until we actually integrate it and become what we're hearing, obviously putting it through our filters of discernment first, and act on it, nothing changes. So it's our choice, and I think we go through life with lots and lots of tiny little choice points. You know, there's always that point, isn't there, when you could make a decision to go this way or that way. Shall I eat the fifth jelly baby on the way here or shall I not? And each choice, no, there you go. Somebody who doesn't like jelly babies, yay. But each choice has a consequence. Because if we ate the sixth and seventh jelly babies, maybe we won't get into our clothes tomorrow. But if we don't, maybe we will. Everything has a choice. And it's often the smallest, tiniest little choices at one point that go on to have a massive effect later on. So we have to become aware of what it is that we're thinking and how we're programming our subconscious mind. Because it's through our language that we create a massive, massive difference to ourselves and around us. Does that make sense? We're using language all the time. And often the internal voice is saying something rather different to the polite mask that is giving something out externally. So we have to become more aware of what it is that we're thinking and what our choices are on each of those choice points. And the choice points relate to fractals. Who has an understanding of fractals here? If I put my hand up, she might pick on me. <laughs> I won't yeah, again. Gary, tell us about fractals. <laughs> Thank you. I have to say that was wonderful and whoosh for my head. <laughs> what I would say, well, I can probably describe it in a way that I find at least understandable, is if you take a piece of broccoli and you snap a piece off, if you look at the small piece, it's actually an exact replica of the big piece. If you pull an even smaller piece off, that is an exact replica of the medium-sized piece and the bigger piece. So it is that whole sacred geometry, which of course is exactly what Gary is describing there. So when I think when we have a small choice point, we make a decision, and then that actually sets us off on a fractal. And I think we can have emotional fractals, spiritual fractals, journey fractals. They don't all have to be broccoli fractals. <laughs> or cauliflower, there you go. So what are the emotional fractals that we're setting ourselves off on? Our relationship fractals. How are we actually creating our own lives according to our thoughts and our beliefs, which might be erroneous? I've run a couple of workshops before. I've been very honored to do that. Some of you may have heard this question before, but can you think of somebody that you didn't like at school? Yeah? It's quite a few. Give me the name of one. <laughs> I can't remember. I don't believe you. But we'll ask somebody else. <laughs> the name of somebody that you didn't like at school. Tracy Ware. There's always the surname. <laughs> it always comes out too. Do we have anybody here called Tracy Ware? No, that is a good start. <laughs> we have no opportunity for any psychodynamics, since I do do marriage guidance counselling too. But there we go. <laughs> well, relationships are relationships at the end of the day. They're not. <laughs> so there we are. So Tracy Ware. Okay. So when you hear, if my name had been Tracy, and I'd even looked a bit like her, you might have found, I hope I don't, <laughs> you might have found it slightly harder to listen to me or to even want to come along and see me today because your subconscious mind, without you even knowing that it's doing it, goes, hang on, people called Tracy are people that we need to be a bit wary of. And if you think I'm talking complete nonsense, did you call any of your children or would you, Tracy? Would you call a child of yours Tracy? No. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so the thing is we can see how the subconscious mind plays itself out because we're making everything relative to what we believe to be true all people call Tracy where we should be a bit wary of <laughs> sorry <laughs> You get where I'm going with this, right? But what we may not realize is that somebody else, we could be somebody else's Tracy. Or we could think, why is this person so offhand with me? Why are they so rude? Why are they kind of putting walls up against me? And it's because we did nothing more than be silly enough to be born with the same name or the same look or the same voice or that same authoritarian tone or whatever it is that used to, perhaps when you were younger, make you think, mm keep out of this one so we could be somebody else we could be triggering somebody else's stuff completely unwittingly that then creates a choice point point. and have you noticed that if you don't like someone else they don't seem to like you very much either it's one of the tenets of neuro-linguistic programming that people like people who like them and who are like them birds of a feather flock together so we tend to be more comfortable with people who are like us and who we feel like us Oh my God! There was a trace in birds of a feather. Who knew such wisdom could come from my mouth? Thank you. <laughs> so it kind of makes sense, doesn't it, that we're starting to see everyone else through the filters of our subconscious mind, and those filters are uninvestigated. The subconscious mind does some amazing things for us. It kind of it keeps our hearts beating, it's digesting your lunch, it's doing all of the things that you're not even thinking about. But it also has to make assumptions. And it programs you. And it programs you through your language. Now, how many of you came up the stairs here and tested each stair to make sure that it was safe? None, because we made the assumption and all the other evidence we've ever gathered throughout our lives, those stairs would be safe. So therefore, we're making the assumption that those stairs are safe. So it's an uninvestigated assumption. We have to have huge numbers of those assumptions. If we didn't, we'd never evolve, would we? Because we'd keep having to test the ground that we're walking on. So we make these assumptions, we make these leaps, we make these judgments according to what we believed then. And even if what we believed then was true, it may not be true today. Absolutely. But we don't. We tend to think whatever happened then must be true today. So we find ourselves on a fractal. And the fractal that we're on is our belief system of then. But we can step on to a different fractal because I think that we're co-creators. Anybody else believe we're co-creators? Expecting lots of hands to come up here, yeah. That was a safe one, <laughs> yeah? So we're co-creators, so we can actually choose consciously to look at something that's happening in our lives and go, I don't like the way this pattern is outflowing. Perhaps I'd like to change it. Shall I have some tools to change it? Shall I step from this fractal onto another fractal? Onto something that I choose that's expansive rather than something that seems to get me tied and knots me up like the hanged man on the tarot card. It's our choice. We can choose to step back from the hanged man. Or we can keep going further and further in. If only they would change. Does anybody else find that kind of works when you're hoping that they would change? So it's about creating that win-win. So what are the tools then that will help us step from one fractal onto another? You guys know stuff, right? Hmm? Find, a new perspective. Find a new perspective. Changing your perspective is a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous thing to do. It's a bit like having the kaleidoscope. If you just change the picture, you get to respond to something completely different. And we can be creative or we can be reactive. And wonderfully, that is an anagram of each other. It's our choice. We react to what's going on or we choose to create what we want and how you want to do it. If you want to be successful in that, then make it win-win so that it's good for you and for the other person. If it's all about you and stuff everyone else. Well, karma, yeah, you know all about that one, right? <laughs> so karma will step in. So it is about what's in our hearts. So I asked you before, can you all think of something that you would like to be able to shift and change? Yeah? 
What's it serving you to remain stuck with it now? Why would you hold on to it? Sorry, whose choice is it? How you're going to live? It's our choice. So why would we hold on to something when we could choose just to let it go? When we could choose to change our perspective and perhaps use a couple of tools which I'll share with you now. It could be a habit. Responsibility. Responsibility. Change requires effort. It takes somewhere between 30 to 60 days to change a habit. Fear of change. Fear of change. And yet, how are you going to get things the way that you want them to be if you don't change? Because we can't change other people because we're only ourselves. But we can change ourselves and we can change the relationships we have with other people. Why? Because of all the relationships that we have are in our heads and in our hearts. See, the relationship that I have with you right now isn't kind of here. It's your perception of me and my perception of you and how we're engaging with the language and communication and energy exchange in the middle. But it's our perception and how we're processing that. Does that make sense? So if we know that our relationships are in our heads and our hearts, where do you think the best place to heal them would be? In our heads and our hearts. And you think of all the situations that you're thinking, I'd quite like to change that. Don't they all involve people? Yeah. If only they change. Well, they won't, but we can. Now, once we change, the interesting thing is that the dynamics of the relationship start to change too. So once we've truly changed, their behavior will start to change around us because we're no longer being triggered by their stuff. We change, they change. Now, they may just test you a little bit first to see whether that change is real. But if it is true, they will start to change too. But you're the leader you're the leader of your own life and you're the leader of the relationship. How easy is that? So easy and yet so hard. So why do we not do it? Because we might have a fear of change. We might think that it takes effort, takes time. Maybe we don't know how to. So think about the people in your life that are causing this particular situation that you're not happy about. How do you feel? What would be the major emotion that you feel? Frustration, anger. Sorry? Oh, that's it. Is it frustration and anger? Okay, we'll take those. Frustration and anger. Anybody not felt frustration and anger? Ever? Welcome to the human race. Anger is actually quite a good thing. It shows us what is not working, what is not right. Hanging around in anger, less good for you. It kind of has an effect on the body, the whole mind-body connection, and the whole spirit-mind-body connection. So it would be a good thing for us to get rid of that anger. So in a way, we need to be able to get rid of it by making some choices. And the choice always comes about when you have an understanding of what's going on in that relationship, when you feel that you've been heard, and when you're able to get to that point of choosing to forgive. Not necessarily because they deserve it, but because it's the only key that you have to set you free. You see, you could be sitting here right now feeling really angry and frustrated with so-and-so. And so-and-so could be out on the golf course, completely unaware of how it is that you're feeling. So you're the one that is sitting here seething and making yourself feel while the other person has no connection with it at all. So it's about looking out for yourself. Because you are the biggest relative that you will ever have in your whole family is to you. You are your own best friend, be your own guru. That's what my whole thing would be about, which I know is interesting in theosophical circles, is it not? But hey, if we're going to throw a few things in, let's just make it fun. <laughs> so, so if you're going to forgive, then there's something about accepting the situation as it is. If you accept something, it doesn't mean you have to like it. It doesn't mean you've stamped all over my left toe, come and stamp all over my right one. But it does give you that freedom to be able to walk away then you'll always find that there is a gift in the situation as well. And that gift might be that you've learned something, that you've evolved. It might be that it's actually freed something up to shift and to change. So did we agree that it was important to apply knowledge? So when we apply knowledge, do we get wisdom? 
Who would like to be wise in about 10 minutes? <laughs> Yay! Okay, so let's do some application. So what I'd like you to do, if you're looking scared, that's always good. <laughs> so what I'd like you to do would be to find something, and I want you to understand how these tools work, so maybe not go for the big one, right? Let's just choose something that's small, maybe something that carved you up on the motorway or whatever it happened to be. Something small so you get to understand the tools. Can everybody think of that thing that they would just like to let go of that bit of frustration about? Did I hear a no? You'll think of something. Um, um. <laughs> it's only a sound away. <laughs> Can everybody think of just something, just so that you get to understand how the tools work? Yeah? So I'm going to invite you then just to close your eyes only because it's easier to get into a nice relaxed space. Yeah, just closing your own eyes is probably the easiest way of doing it, trying to close other people's eyes. Good. <coughs> so two things happen with your eyes closed. It's easier A, to get into a nice relaxed state, and B, if you're worried that you're going to look like an idiot, you can't see them, they can't see you. It's all a lot more peaceful. So with your eyes closed, just taking a couple of deep breaths, imagine that you're breathing in a beautiful bright white shining light in through the crown of your head, breathing it down into each and every cell of your body and out through the soles of your feet. Good work. Noticing that you become twice as relaxed with each breath that you take of that beautiful bright white healing light. Fantastic. Good work. And what I'd like you to do right now is to imagine that person with whom you need to have a conversation and imagine them sitting down in a red velvet chair. You are sitting in a red velvet chair opposite them. And to start off with, you start to speak to them and you tell them that you'd like them to listen to what you have to say. And that you'd like them not to interrupt, but just to hear you. And in your mind, I want you now to start talking to them but first of all, I want you to tell them how annoyed you were at what they did. And as this is in the privacy of your own mind, you can shout, you can swear, but let them know exactly how frustrated and angry their behavior made you feel. And make sure they get to hear every single thing. is the chance for you to get it off your chest. Tell them every element. And another thing. That's right. Good work. And just keep going through that whole list that you have of all those things that have really, really annoyed you. Fantastic. Good work. That's right. And very soon you'll find that you've told them everything that you need to tell them. And when you have, still keeping your eyes closed, when you feel that you've told them everything that you need to tell them about how angry and frustrated you are, just raise your hand for me and then put it down. Good work. That's right. And then putting your hand down when you're ready. Good work. Fantastic. <coughs> Keeping your eyes closed. That's right. Knowing that you've only done just the first bit, but already it feels a little bit lighter that you've managed to get all of this anger and frustration off your chest and that other person sat and listened. Good work. And now what I'd like you to do is just to listen to my words as you breathe in from that beautiful bright white shining light, breathing it in through the crown of your head, down through each and every cell of your body and out through the soles of your feet. What I'd like you to do, as I say, is just to listen to my words, knowing that in a moment I'll be inviting you to forgive that person. Not because you condone their actions, not because what they did was right, but because it's time for you to be set free. Because it's time for you to be a little lighter, 
to be able to step a little more into your power, to be able to be expanded, to allowing that inner light to shine through. Good work. And so now choosing something, which might be something small, that you can forgive that person for, and look at them and say to them, I choose to forgive you for, and forgive them for that small thing. It's a choice. You're the one in power. You're the leader here, as you choose now to forgive that person. Good work. You'll find as you've forgiven that person for the first element that you're able to forgive something else too. And you forgive them for that. And you say to them, I choose to forgive you. Good work. And you go through your whole list of all those things that made you angry and frustrated. Choosing to forgive them because it sets you free. And with each exercise of forgiveness, you find yourself feeling a little lighter and lighter. Good work. That's right. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. Good work. And knowing now that you choose to make that decision to look them deep in the eye and say to them, I choose to forgive you for absolutely everything right from the bottom of my heart. And I accept you for who you are. And you realize now that you want to drop judgment. You don't need to judge them anymore. Like you, they've been doing the best they could with what they know. And so you find it easy to accept. And you accept that they may or they may never change. And that's entirely up to them. It's not your business. But for now, you've accepted how it's been and that you're now free to move on. And in your mind's eye, you now shake hands with that person or give them a hug, or whatever it is that feels appropriate for you. And you allow your heart to connect in with their heart energy. That is love, that cleanses. You notice how good that feels. Good work. And then you step back and you notice in their hands, the other person has a gift for you. And it may be something that you recognize or it may be something that you don't, but you will be able to remember it when you come back. It may even be nothing, and that's absolutely fine too. Good work. And then you thank that person for listening. And you tell them that it's now time for them to leave. And they nod, and they step through the door, and they close it firmly behind them, leaving you on your own for a moment. And as you look down at your body, you're aware of some of the dirty, sticky, cobwebby energy that all of this hurt and anger has been in your body. And you allow yourself now to pull it out from your body and to pile it up into the center of the room. It feels lighter again as you're pulling it all off your body and you notice how good that feels. And you notice that by your right foot now in your imagination, there's a silver box. And you pick up the box and inside, there's a purple match. And you take that match and you strike it, and it lights with a beautiful velvet violet flame, the flame of transmutation. And you set fire to all that dark, sticky, cobwebby energy, and it starts to burn bright, burning through all of the illusions of the past, as it now starts to turn to a beautiful, bright, white, golden light of pure, unconditional love. And you step into that light now. And you allow yourself to feel it. It's like a cool warmth of menthol. It's as though it cleanses each and every cell of your body, your heart, your mind, your chakras, throughout your aura. And it feels so good. And you're aware of that spiritual connection of your divine spark 
to the divine. And you notice how good that feels. Deep down in each and every cell. Good work. And you allow yourself just to enjoy the last few moments of that cleansing, that energizing, that renewing, that refreshing. As you hear these words echoing around in your mind's ear, I am love. I am love. I am love. I am truth. I am truth. I am truth. I am light. I am light. I am light. Good work. And then noticing in a moment that it'll be time to come back on the count of three. On one, feeling deeply serene, peaceful, at ease. On two, feeling a sense of renewed energy, invigorated, excited about all that the future has to offer you as you step into your power. As on three, starting to come back, eyes open, wide awake right now. Which was nice. <laughs> so, how do you feel? Some people find that quite hard. Yep, it could not be harder than doing it here now, could it? Normally I would take people through this over maybe one, even one and a half hours or so. It would be a one-to-one -one session where you'd actually be speaking out loud. Your subconscious mind does not distinguish, by the way, between very vivid imagination and reality. So healing all of those relationships in your head and your heart is as good as having the conversation with the other person. Oh, and by the way, if you try and have that conversation with the other person, they don't always go, yeah, of course, bring it on, tell me all about it. <laughs> Sometimes they get a bit kind of knocky about it too, or might want to have their say. So the safest place in a way to do it is in the head and in your heart. So how do you feel? Better? Yeah? So you couldn't feel anything other than better, really, could you? And I did say, Go for the big, go for the small one. Don't go for the big one. Go for the something that's small and light. So I wanted you to get the tools. And the tools are that in your mind, you're having that conversation with that other person. First of all, you're expressing all of the negative emotions which have been weighing you down. When you've got them off your chest, there's always that sort of sense of, I can see it when I'm working with clients. Shoulders go down. We know we're through that bit. That's when there's a point that your psyche, your soul is ready to make that decision. Even if your ego is going, I don't want to. You know that there's a point, that compulsive point that says, it's time now to forgive in order for you to move further along your path. So your next tool is about forgiveness and then acceptance and letting go. And do you remember what your gifts were? Does everybody get a gift? Anybody want to share a gift? And if you don't, that's fine. Sorry? Peace and quiet. <laughs> I'll be quiet in a minute, I promise you. Forgive me. <laughs> Peace and quiet is a good one. Anybody get nothing as the gift? Okay. Nothing is fabulous, isn't it? Because nothing is no thing. So what does pure potential look like? Nothing. So you can make of it what you will. 